Well, good afternoon and welcome uh, from London to an FS Club webinar and good afternoon and welcome to our special guest, Professor Avinash Perso, dialing in uh, this morning from Barbados. And we're here today to talk about climate change, an uninsurable risk and what role should finance play. And I'm really delighted that Abby chose his subject today. Abby preceded me as Gresham Professor of Commerce, so he is my senior. Uh, and I've always admired his thinking, and I'm really delighted uh, that he's coming to share it today because he's got a unique perspective, uh, understanding you know very very much the global world of finance and participating and uh, saving us from the, the previous meltdowns of 2007, 8, and 9. Um, but he's been giving a lot of thought post pandemic, but also post uh, catastrophe. Uh, you'll know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien, and it really is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars, and I'm only able to do so thanks to the tolerance and generosity of our sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today's subject, uh, climate change and the insurability, clearly fall into two of those buckets very solidly and a little bit into the technology bucket. Now, the format today uh, takes a fa fairly familiar form to regulars. Uh, I'll be getting out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert and we will then move, uh, Abby's got about 20 minutes of discussion about what he means by an uninsurable risk and what can really be done about it. And then we will move into a question and answer session with me fielding questions that you send me. So three items, if I may. Firstly, uh, the website has the slides, the bio, everything's up there that you might need. Uh, secondly, yes, this is being recorded and it will go up in approximately two working days, so sometime probably Friday afternoon. And I would also point out that uh, please do use the GoToWebinar Q&A facility. There's no point in signaling me, WhatsApping me, WeChatting me, emailing me, texting me. All the various methods of communication are in suspension for the next 45 minutes because I'm here with you. Uh, but if you send it into the Q&A facility, I will uh, feed it into the discussion. Abby will be getting a copy of all the questions, comments, and observations, which I'm sure you'll have many. Uh, and if you'd like him to respond to you personally, just simply indicate that, but he will get the email along with your comment, question, and observation. So really, I, I think with no further ado, uh, Professor Avinash Perso, my predecessor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and indeed, you know, you, you mentioned our connection at, at Gresham, uh, a wonderful institution. I, I always tell people that a measure of, of, uh, of whether my term was a success or not was the immense quality of the person who came afterwards. Uh, if I'd done a really bad job, no one would have wanted to be a Gresham professor. <laughs> but thankfully, uh, that wasn't too bad, um, and you, you know, you've got uh, a good helping of weirdness, as evidenced by uh, the titles of your books, like *The Price of Fish*, a fantastic book, by the way, which I strongly recommend. Um, so, climate change, an uninsurable risk. And uh, I grew up in the UK, as you can tell from my from my accent, but I guess I really began understanding climate change um, and its implications for finance when I got a call in. September, uh, probably the 17th of September, 2017. Um, we, it was the worst uh, Atlantic hurricane season in a while. And the second uh, monster hurricane, uh, this one called Maria, uh, had hit uh, Dominica and in four hours had wiped out 226% of GDP. I remember when I was going around uh, talking about that, a lot of uh, uh, well-educated economists and others w w would say to me, can you lose more than 100% of GDP? Uh, and they lost 226%. Uh, and I was uh, almost literally parachuted in. Uh, it was tough to get in there at the time uh, to try and, and see what we could do to, to lend our support and help uh, to build back Dominica. But one of the first problems, um, uh, Michael, and you'd appreciate this, was, was to maintain attention because the world is full of disasters. And uh, we felt that uh, a week later, people would not remember Dominica. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we concocted a, a cunning plan, which was that the Dominicans, and they were all very much in favor of this, and, and uh, uh, came, really stepped up to the plate and grasped the opportunity, that they would announce that they were going to build back 
by building the first climate resilient nation in, a wor in the world. Uh, and the allure of that is that they were small enough that they could do it. They might not do it well, they might not do it quickly, they might not do it cheaply, but they could do it. And, um, uh, and they were big enough to be a nation with all the aspects of having to deal with the nation. So you're not just thinking about buildings, you're thinking about people, about livelihoods, uh, about the psychology as well as the physicality of issues, uh, as we've all got to know with COVID. So um, I began studying and thinking about climate change because that had been a particularly horrendous uh, uh, Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, and um, normally you get uh, one category five hurricane, and that means wind speeds. Categories are based on wind speeds. That means a wind speed is you know, around 200 kilometers an hour. Uh, people would say that um, the wind was so severe that normally you just hear the wind and, and they hear it as a howling. Uh, most people who were locked inside as the wind was howling outside would say that they had this enormous quandary because the wind sounded like hundreds of people banging on the door saying, help me, help me, please open the door. And they'd have to tell themselves, no, no, that's the wind. Uh, and, and they shouldn't open the door. But they would also say that they could actually see the wind. It was so strong. They could hear it. They could feel it. They could see it. Uh, and um, this was just a, a fairly horrendous thing, a traumatizing thing for, for, for the people of, of Dominica. Um, category five hurricanes are unusual. And they'd had two in two weeks. Uh, and so I began looking at uh, what was going on, which is, which is a kind of a, 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 almost a thousand year event. So as we all know in finance, these thousand year events seem to be occurring more often. Uh, and uh, so we began thinking about what was going on and what was wrong with our risk modeling. And the thing I learned is that the campaigners against climate change, uh, a noble cause, have gone the route of trying to explain to people that this is going to impact the entire world, that we're all in this together. And the reason why they've done that is because they want to have the broadest coalition against climate change and pressing back against the movement in climate change, whether that is in fiscal policy, uh, whether that is uh, uh, in technology, uh, environmental policy, etc. But what is also very clear is that whilst we will all be impacted in the long run, the short run impact of climate change is actually very differential. Indeed, there's some parts of the world that benefit from climate change. In the, cli in the temperate climates, the growing season for crops has got wider. In the tundra, a land that had previously been frozen solid and unusable has become usable again. Uh, and so the economic spread of the impact of climate change is not uniform. And yet, uh, and, and the countries uh, where the biggest insurance companies, the biggest reinsurance companies, tend to be in those countries for whom climate change is not really a major event today. No one is anticipating that a loss and damage of climate events might be as much as a half a percent of GDP of these large industrial northern countries. And so they think, it, well, this is a small impact. Uh, this is an event that is in the future, and therefore maybe we can ensure it. So when I went around with looking at Dominica, most people in, in the northern uh, countries would say to me, have you guys thought about insurance? Uh, surely insurance is the way you need to go. And I remember looking at Dominica's situation and Dominica had uh, a, suffered from uh, storm Ophelia where they'd lost 45% of GDP. And then uh, four years later, they had storm Erica where they lost 96% of their GDP. And then two years after that, they had tropical hurricane Maria, where they lost 226% of GDP. Now imagine you are selling them insurance and you want to protect yourself against making those payouts. Uh, this, the kind of premium you would need is intolerable. But quite apart from that example, um, it doesn't, uh, what's happening with climate change in the front line on climate change? Let me just describe the front line a little bit more clearly. So the front line lies between the tropics of Cancer and the tropics of Capricorn. Why is that? That is where the world is going to heat up, 
but that is where temperatures are already warm and they go from warm to intolerable. That's where we're having great floods and droughts. The second thing, and, and I'm a you know an economist, so that means I know no science, right? So um, I, I remember coming across this fact and finding it weird, but most scientists would think it's normal, which is that when the polar ice caps melt, sea level does not increase at the poles. In fact, sea level is falling at the poles as the ice caps melt, because as the ice caps melt, the land, uh, no longer having the weight of the burden of the glaciers, is rising. That water is actually, because the Earth spins, ends up around the equator. So the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, this band uh, around the equator, is where they've had the most intolerable increases in temperatures, the biggest increases in sea level, and the combination of the two is deadly, because that's what makes hurricanes uh, devastating. It's not just the wind speed. In fact, it's not the wind speed. The categories are based on wind speed. But what makes them deadly is the amount of water, the amount how wet they are. And rising sea levels and rising sea temperatures is making these cyclones in the Pacific and the Caribbean, making the droughts in Africa tougher. Uh, so um, the, 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 the differential impact uh, is very strong. Uh, and and so um, now imagine you're in, the, you're in the front line of climate change. Um, this is an event that has got a big impact and it's rising. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, Michael. So um, we have a, a we, uh, maybe I should start back and say, um, what is the, if we are insurers, what's the ideal risk that we want? We want something that may be a big event, and that's why you're worried about it and want to insure it, but it's pretty random. It's, uh, it, it's uh, hard to predict when it's going to happen. It's fairly rare. Uh, so it doesn't make sense for you carrying a lot of self insurance about this event that may occur next year or may occur in the next 25 years. Um, it's not rising in frequency, not rising in impact, and it's uncorrelated. Think of the Asian tsunami. Massive tsunami, huge impact. 225,000 people died in the Asian tsunami uh, in Indonesia and in Aceh province. Uh, big event, only impacted about 1% of GDP, but that's a kind of random, rare event you could insure against. Imagine something that is increasing in frequency increasing in impact. The impact is wipeout. You've got nowhere to hide. Uh, you've got no nowhere to go. Sometimes you know you you, you see these um, these pictures, these satellite pictures of the earth. You see the curvature of the earth, you see a massive monster hurricane. And the, the weatherman has sort of drawn drawn out the, the outline of the islands that are underneath this massive monster that you can't see. These hurricanes are bigger than the islands that they hit. They're bigger than the countries and nations that they hit. Uh, and here's the other issue. It is not only a large, rising, correlated risk. Climate change is correlated with temperatures, with sea level rising, um, uh, with uh, sargassum seaweed, the, uh, the, you know, the, the algae in the sea. Um, uh, many of you may, may know the, the vaguely familiar, the notion of the wide sargasso sea which is this algae that is in the mid-Atlantic and there's also in the mid-Pacific, uh, which accumulates there because of centrifugal forces of the Earth. This algae is spreading out uh, from the, the, the mid-Atlantic and spreading out to countries, filling up beaches, highly correlated with climate change. So all of these disasters are being highly correlated. Um, and so it's like you have a, a, a pre-existing medical ailment where you need to spend twice as much of your entire income to cure yourself. And this is happening of increasing frequency. And an important issue is it's also known. When something's random and unknown, we can throw things together in a pool. But imagine we have a pool of, of insurable risks, and along comes Michael uh, with his climate change illness. Uh, and we know it's a high probability of a major event. We don't want him in our pool. If we had no idea of when it might happen, we might consider maybe we can hedge this. But a known pre-existing problem with a high and rising impact that's highly correlated with other problems, we don't want to, we want to, we don't want to share that. <laughs> so uh, people are going to find that they can't share that risk. So what is the alternative? It's building resilience. 
And I hadn't really thought about that. We can go to the next uh, slide, Michael, uh, until I saw uh, on the ground what was happening in countries like Dominica and St. Martin and BVI uh, after the hurricane. Because we used to think, and we grew, grew up thinking, that a Category 5 hurricane, you can't protect yourself against that. There's just no way. You might be able to protect your building against a Category 3 hurricane, but, but Category 4, all bets are off. And then here's this little country uh, which has survived a Category 5. And in the middle of devastation, there would be a perfect bridge standing. There would be an amazing road standing. Uh, and you realize that um, sometimes you can build. And so uh, we started off with this notion that if we're going to be, be the, the, most the, the first climate resilient nation in the world, we need to build resiliently. And it led us to another point. We had some amazing scientists who came along to speak to us, uh, the Columbia Institute, Rockefeller Foundation, the Norwegians. Everyone wanted to be involved in the building the first climate resilient nation in the world. I created a, a, um, an agency called CREED, the Climate Resilient Execution Agency of Dominica, that was going to build the first climate resilient nation. And one of these maverick mad scientists came to us and as we were all thinking, and all of us were thinking about, you know, uh, resiliency. So that means like thicker walls, deeper foundations, and that's more and more expensive and heavier, heavier. And the guy said, well, you know what? Hurricanes don't happen in randomly and instantaneously. Uh, you always have at least two to three hours notice. So why don't we have a collapsible bridge? We collapse the bridge, hurricanes pass after four hours, we open back up the bridge. You have instant bridge availability after the hurricane. And one of our definitions of what does it mean to be climate resilient, the question that Michael threw out at the beginning, was how long it takes for you to get back in the running. And it may be collapsible infrastructure, infrastructure, uh, you know, telecoms towers that collapse into the ground, solar panels that collapse into, into roofs uh, uh, is the way to build resiliency as opposed to building it always heavier, stronger, thicker, uh, which of course uh, is a challenge. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, resiliency is not just about buildings. How do you make individuals psychologically resilient? Uh, many people have experienced that issue in COVID. If we'd said this, during a hurricane disaster, people wouldn't, outside of the hurricane region, wouldn't have understood what we meant. But if you send people in your in their home and say you can't come out, and there's no food and there's no water and there's no there's no police force uh, and people are looting outside and um, you know uh, it impacts ones. People need a certain degree of certainty and clarity and visibility. So it's not just about buildings, it's about livelihoods, it's about psychology, it's about health systems, it's about education. In, in many of the hurricane uh, countries of the world, the hurricane sa uh, shelter is the school. So they build a safe and powerful school. Uh, and um, uh, But the problem with that is that when you've got all of your people in the school, there's no school. So one of the challenges we had in uh, in the Caribbean after 2017 was that we had all the schools used up with, as shelters and education stopped. And that wasn't a great thing for all kinds of reasons. So um, we need to build resiliency, but resiliency is expensive. And the public sector does not have the money to build resiliency. So we can go to the next slide, uh, Michael. I think that one of the things that we're thinking about, and we've started a pilot study with the International Financial Corporation uh, of the World Bank uh, in Barbados and Dominica, and we're hoping to spread this out, is um, rating investments by their resilience. Now, that sounds pretty easy. But what we've learned is that resilience is not idiosyncratic. Resilience is an individual. Resilience is part of a system. In Barbados, we've developed a system uh, which we call Roofs to Reefs. The idea of it is that resilience is, is connected from every, right through the entire chain, right from the uh, people's roofs and the runoff of water from roofs uh, and what that, where that water goes to, right down to your reefs uh, when the water goes into the sea and impacts the reefs and corrodes the reefs. So what does that do for your, for your um, uh, ocean health and, uh, and fish and food and all of those things? So uh, the system is connected. So we would rate investments 
as to how they measure not only on individual resilience, but on systemic resilience. And then we'd ask for managers to manage money, public money, private money, to a rating of resilience. So the fund managers will say, this fund, uh, I'm only investing in things that rate above this on resilience, that are part of a resilient plan and are individually resilient. And they generate, I, I'm investing because they generate a revenue. Some people might ask, are there revenues in these investments? Well, you know, uh, take renewable energy. And of course, renewable energy does not mean resilient energy. Uh, all the solar panels on the roofs of Dominica got crushed. All of the solar panels in Puerto Rico uh, got crushed. Uh, we have to make renewable energy resilient. Uh, wind, uh, wind turbines uh, are not built to withstand uh, a Category 5 hurricane. Most of them. Uh, and so, uh, but it, so it's not that we can't do renewables, we have to make renewables resilient. Uh, and, um, but take the feed in tariffs that the Germans and the Spanish and Italians have, have, have pioneered. We have those feed in tariffs in the developing world. They generate real returns of 12 to 14 uh, percent, uh, fairly safe returns because the, the utility companies providing these revenues. So you've got a private equity type return without a private equity type risk. So there are returns to be had. And channeling money into these kind of investments, uh, therefore, is good from the private sector, from the social sector, from the public sector. And what we are observing, Michael, is that a tremendous amount of private money in uh, public sector pension funds and private pension funds and insurance companies are declaring that they want to invest in resilient things, but they can't find resilient things. There is a asymmetry. And so we think that we need a new rating structure that rates resiliency, but not by individual uh, assets, but by how the asset fits into a resilient plan. Let me go to the uh, next slide, uh, Michael. We could talk more uh, more about that. Uh, and uh, this talks a little bit about the fact that these are not, uh, you know, they, they are types of investments. They are public investments where there's no income stream. The public needs to do it. Um, the private sector perhaps cannot do it. Perhaps it includes, for example, uh, making sure that social housing is resilient. Uh, and um, because, some might, because the poor will not be able to be as resilient as the rest of us can be. Um, and then there are these other projects where there's a private sector generating an income. Now, I should add one final thing before I go to the next and final point, which is that in, if this were to, uh, if the, the developed world was on the front line, if your insurance contracts um, were completely comprehensive, then you might say, well, insurance companies now have a liability that they would want to, in, to invest money in reducing that liability. So maybe they could fund the resilience building. The problem today is the front line is in the parts of the world where things are underinsured already. We start off from a point of underinsurance. If we started off a point of, of insurance, that's one thing. But now you start off from a point of underinsurance, it's very hard for an insurer to make money by insuring this risk. Uh, so let me go to uh, a, a, the, the, the final point I'd like to make in the next slide, Michael. So um, we talked um, a, a little bit about uh, how we need to uh, deal with 226% of GDP uh, by making it 26% of GDP or 2.6% of GDP by making things more resilient. We can't get rid of any costs, any loss and damage, but we've got to bring it down to a scale which could be insured. Um, a scale where we could um, have contingent instruments that helped us out. And one of the instruments that we have pioneered in Barbados, and, and to some extent um, a little bit inadvertently uh, uh, at the time, we thought it was a good idea, I didn't realize how useful it would be, is the Barbados Natural Disaster Clause. In our Natural Disaster Clauses, and we're now the world's biggest issuer, of sovereign bonds with natural disaster clauses. So we're the world's biggest issuer uh, of sovereign bonds with natural disaster clauses. All of our bonds have natural disaster clauses. And when an independent agency declares that a natural disaster has occurred, what happens in these bonds and these clauses is that no principal repayment and no interest payment is made for two years. Two years is the minimum length of time you need to recover, you've got this instant liquidity. In our case, we get instantly 7% of GDP in liquidity. 
If the world had these bonds, if the all developing countries have these bonds, it would have created, and let's say the natural disaster included the pandemic, it would have created one trillion dollars of liquidity. Now let me put that one trillion dollars in contrast with what did the world do. The world swung into action and came up with something called the DSSI. That is the uh, debt, um, uh, debt Sustainability Initiative, the Debt Suspension Initiative. Uh, and this said for a bunch of poor countries, you didn't need to repay your principal and interest for 12 months. This saved uh, the world 12, uh, potentially $12 billion. It was a clunky apparatus, you had to apply for it. And the minute you applied for it, you went into an IMF program. And so that made some people reluctant. And so actually it only saved $5.5 billion so far. So compare that with $1 trillion and $5.5 billion. No wonder that uh, some of the biggest economic collapses in the world have occurred in the developing countries. They are really short of liquidity, of fiscal space, monetary space. So we're trying to push uh, these clauses to be more universal. But you learn from your mistakes. Uh, and uh, we've learned how we need to tweak these clauses. First, we need to make sure they include things like pandemics. Uh, anything that you are not in control of is a natural phenomenon. And we need to come up with a definition of that. Uh, they need to be big impacts, but still rare events. Secondly, I think these clauses should be NPV neutral. They weren't designed to be NPV neutral. If they're not NPV neutral, net present value neutral, essentially the owner of the bond is writing insurance, insuring other people against a natural disaster. Well, as we discussed, if the natural disaster is a rising frequency and a big impact and correlated, no one wants to do that. But if it's NPV neutral, if yes, you, you lose your interest and in principal for two years, but you get it back at a higher level later on, at the end of the term of the loan, uh, then you are simply shuffling liquidity around, not taking a, a, a credit risk. Uh, and so we want these bonds to be, these clauses to be NPV neutral. And then, Michael, I know this will excite you, we want them to be strippable. So an insurance company might then say, oh, I will buy this strip. I will buy the option that if a natural disaster hits, I get instantly extra maturity. Uh, because I'm short of maturity and you have an instrument that lengthens maturity. Uh, and you will pay me for this thing that lengthens maturity. Uh, and so strippable, NPV neutral, natural disaster clauses, universal, will provide the kind of liquidity that countries will still need, even when they've built resiliently. Uh, and let me end my, my final slide then, uh, Michael. And I'm keen to hear uh, what uh, what the, your listeners and audience have to, have to say. Um, uh, I don't think that for climate change, and there are other risks which are very insurable, uh, but for climate change, it's not an insurable risk. But that does not mean to say that finance cannot play a major role in finding solutions and coming up with innovative ways of automatically providing liquidity. We know that the liquidity we can provide is never going to be massive. It might be 7% of GDP, not 27 or 270%. And for that, we need to build differently. We need to build resiliently. And resilience building, we can be innovative. It might not always be uh, building bigger and heavier. It might be disposable, flexible, collapsible. Uh, uh, and then um, we need to raise funding for that. And how do we do that? We need to have we need to rate things for fund managers to get a clear signal of what is sustainable. And uh, and because people want to invest in sustainable things that generate an income, but they want to know it really is sustainable. And what we've learned is sustainability is not individual, it's systemic. Imagine I have the world's most sustainable bridge, Michael, but all the roads leading to the bridge have been washed away. That is not useful. And so I need to put my sustainability in the context of a system. And I need a rating that tells me that this project actually makes the system more resilient as well as it being more resilient. Uh, and a systemic resilience is what we're after, not necessarily individual resilience. So let me end there and invite you to for your thoughts and comments and questions. Uh, and uh, and uh, let's discuss how finance can play a role for climate change and uninsurable risk. 
Wow, Abby, masterful and extremely interesting. Folks, please do keep your questions and comments coming in. Uh, just a couple of things, Abby. Uh, firstly, on the Barbadian natural disaster clauses, how, how many times have those been invoked? And, uh, well, and you, you indicated that they don't cover pandemic. Um, what other things don't they cover that you might consider to be in that? I think what's important from a sort of insurance point of view, uh, Michael, as, as you will know, uh, we have you know, asymmetrical information, adverse selection issues, moral hazard. So we include those things that we can't control. So it might it would be a natural disaster, which go, which for us is primarily hurricanes, but also volcanic earthquake, uh, anything that um, uh, that that we're not in control of and is bigger than us. Um, some people would like. Uh, uh, to include things like trade vulnerability, um, the, uh, of, of uh, sort of social vulnerability, and we're a bit concerned that that will then get a bit messy because those are things you can do something about. I can't do anything about a hurricane heading straight towards me, but I can do something about trade vulnerability in terms of diversifying my trade, etc. Um, uh, although it is difficult if you're a small place to do that, and more difficult for others. So it is physical, natural, um, and I think the key thing, Michael, is you have an early, you have an, uh, an independent, it has to be something where there's an independent signal that it happened. It can't be something that takes you three months to work out, oh, you had a natural disaster, <laughs> because by then, you know, so that's why pandemics actually fits into that. Now, we, we all have our uh, various uh, things that we can think about that WHO could have done better, but they do have a process of early warning on pandemics. And maybe that should be strength, stronger and more resilient and more robust, but it's there. So I, I think adding pandemics would be quite easy. Now, we put this in all of our bonds in 2017, when we did, 2018, 2019, when we restructured. We didn't give the creditors much choice. We said, here are the new bonds, and they've got natural disaster clauses in them. Initially, they said, no, thank you. Uh, and they kept on coming back with counter offers, and we kept on coming back with counter offers on yields and whatever, uh, but never on the natural disaster clauses. They've been trading now for about two years. We have no premium for having a natural disaster clause. If, if anything, as in no yield premium, if anything, our bonds are trading slightly rich compared to their rating. And it may be a sign that having a natural disaster clause actually improves your credit quality. Imagine a disaster hits you that wipes out 226% of your GDP. The first thing the credit is going to think is you can't pay your bonds. You're going to default. So having an automatic mechanism which says, okay, you don't for two years and then you start back again when you've recovered actually improves credit quality. It's amazing that the 2017 crisis was a benefit. I think you've answered this, um, and you answered it sort of in your presentation on the fact that this rolls forward and gets a, a neutral NPV. But Angel Gaviero, you know, what is the excess spread these bonds have with natural disaster clauses, i.e. the cost that contingent extra for that contingent extra liability? And you're saying it's zero or even slightly beneficial. That's amazing. Our our bonds are not NPV neutral, and it's still zero. If anything, we think that's been a negative. Uh, we've actually had a yield decline because people say it improves your credit quality. I think the market is saying it improves your credit quality. I think if we make them NPV neutral, it would be even better. Mm. And uh, when you said strippable, naturally, I thought about uh, naked bonds and uncovered. But uh, <laughs> could you explain a little bit on what you would like to refine in that in the, on those clauses? Right, so there are going to be some holders, say like a bank, that uh, is going to find it a little bit hard to deal with the, 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 the switch in liquidity. So, you know, the instrument hasn't lost its solvency, it hasn't lost your, your total end repayments as NPV neutral, but suddenly they, they lack liquidity when they need it. There'll be other people, like uh, long-term pension life, life insurers and pension funds, who have a lot of liquidity, who are investing for a long term and might be happy to uh, buy um, that that instrument uh, or, or or be on the other side of that trade um, and offer to get paid for offering liquidity when a natural disaster hits in return for, for lengthening the maturity of their asset. Now we've seen, uh, of course, the rise of uh, catastrophe bonds. Um, the Caribbean had a, a 
prototype out there, which I, personally I think got caught just a little bit too early for, as it was kind of getting off the ground. But I, I would like you to explain that in a second. Um, but we've also had, of course, uh, these recent volcano catastrophe bonds issued out of Guernsey. Uh, how do you see that catastrophe bond market working with, um, you know, basically with sovereign debt? I think you need a, a, a panoply of instruments. We're going to need contingent credit facilities, liquidity facilities, cap bonds, and then we need to, to think about those things which you can't naturally insure, whether through the market, and cap bonds is a type of market-based insurance, it's still insurance, uh, and I think there's, there are many natural risks which remain um, not rising, uh, not correlated, uh, fairly random, not known risk, of which earthquake and volcanic are similar. Uh, so I think those cap bonds will continue. You may find that the, the definitions of them begin to change as we begin to know which things um, are remain random uh, and rare events and which things are actually changing in their correlation uh, and in their frequency. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned the, 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 what's called CRIF, which is the Caribbean Risk Insurance Facility. Uh, financing facility is one of the first regional um, uh, insurance facilities and it, it provides insurance for the countries against natural disasters um, but the problem is because of these risks increasing the amount they can provide uh, is a very far short of the uh, offset of the potential wipeout so in the case of Dominica the CRIF provided the first slug of money they were very very quick that's the nice thing about insurance mechanism has been triggered you get your payout um, um, normally not always uh, so um, but it was like uh, it was like two percent of GDP so here's a country reeling under the, the sucker punch of a 226 percent GDP loss and the insurance policy pays out two percent so nice thank you very much but not really enough mm. Um, Hugh Purser makes a, an analogy here. He says, in the VC world, it used to be common, well, still is, to take out what uh, we used to call key man insurance, insuring against the sudden incapacity of the lead entrepreneur or, or the team. Uh, and that's kind of a resilient investment rating for, for smaller firms. But um, leading on, I mean, you mentioned a, a resilience rating, and that sounds appealing, and I can see it. And then immediately my mind started turning into, how would I go about working it through? Uh, you also indicated it's systemic, so I can't just look at the bridge. I got to look at the whole system and the new bridge's contribution to the resilience of the system. Um, do you see that resilience rating as as being a national rating or a local rating? Uh, you know, is it rating, for example, the road infrastructure of Barbados, or is it rating Barbados as a whole? So uh, we've started a pilot with the IFC, um, uh, the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank. And uh, what we're doing is, uh, and because it's a pilot, you know, we, we are uh, uh, we are feeling our way in the dark a little bit. Uh, and Michael, I know a, a number of your uh, of your fans and your loyal loyal listeners might be interested in this. And if they are, I'd be happy for to to consider someone to come and give us some advice as an investor. Um, as the kind of, of, of things that would make a difference to them if they're, if they're concerned about social impact. But what we're doing is the IFC is coming, working with the Barbados government, the Dominican government, and looking at our resilient national plan. And then ide identifying within the resilient national plan, what are the projects out there that fit in with this plan? Um, and so, uh, uh, and it would also look at projects that give you a private sector return. So then you'll be rated not on the private sector return, that's up to the fund manager to, to work out whether that's good enough, uh, but it'll be rated on the two things. How resilient is the project itself, but how does it fit in with systemic resilience? Years and years ago, you and I used to riff about financial uh, systemic uh, uh, stability and with the notion that actually you could have a system where individual things are unsafe, but the system is safe. Uh, and uh, what we were building at the time, and, and you and I were thinking a lot about this, was a system where the individual things seemed safe, but the system was unsafe. Now, we need to think in a more systemic sense, uh, in a more macro-prudential sense on 
a natural disaster resilience and climate resilience. And so that's why we need, like you do for macroprudential regulation, you consider the two things, not just the one thing. Um, Henry Winon, who's deep into the insurance sector and, in fact, a previous guest on our, our shows, uh, you mentioned the option for insurers or funds, too, one assumes, to buy the strippable clauses. Could an approach be for the option to purchase the strippable clauses to be tradable themselves? Uh, sort of a natural, Definitely. I guess, yeah. Definitely. I had a chat with uh, uh, with the World Bank chief economist about this, and, uh, and they're quite excited about these kind of state contingent clauses. And I was talking to her about the fact that we could actually create a bit of a market if we make them tradable. Uh, because now an insurance company would get paid for something that it it doesn't that it has but doesn't get paid for, which is the ability to be liquid in, uh, and get the money paid back at some point. Um, so it gets paid for offering that liquidity. Um, but the, so you have a ready seller, the bank, the short-term liability bank, and a ready buyer, the long-term liability insurer, and therefore we have a market. Uh, mm. And why can this not trade? Um, and so we'll be creating a market in maturity transformations. Uh, Hugh Moore um, is, is sort of curious. If Barbados is the biggest issue of these bonds, uh, it sounds as if you actually pioneered them. Is that true? And secondly, who, who are the other two or three down the, the rankings? Well, they're only, and we're not going to remain, the, if we're successful in trying to uh, to sell it to the world, uh, we won't remain the biggest because we're quite a small place. Uh, but we're the biggest because we had a lot of debt and we did a debt restructuring and we put all of our debt in natural disaster clauses. So if you're the UK and Canada, we're working with the Canadians okay. to try and persuade them, um, is that they'll start with new issues. Um, the other countries done it is Grenada. There's some other countries that are thinking of doing it, but um, we're, we're the biggest so far. Early days, but absolutely interesting. And of course, you know, coming to fruition in some senses. Um, Henry Winan, I was also curious, do you see a role for insurance in ensuring the building of the resilient infrastructure versus the infrastructure once it's been built? So the kind of the project insurance. Oh, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good idea. And, and indeed, a kind of... Um, new type of insurance and then you, you've often talked to me about these things where you're insuring the commitment being made <laughs> so the, the 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 builder the contractor is basically making a promise uh and um uh we can uh, and we could turn that promise into an insurance contract yeah. now madhu acharya has made uh, uh, three points in a row and i i think they're in violent agreement with you but i'll read them out they're, they're very good it's it, it starts off really with climate risk is not uh, is not insurable in the traditional and legal insurance structures we have today. Um, and therefore we need to focus more on mitigation of the financial impact of climate risk rather, rather than more on risk transfer. But he does point out that insurance should be used much more in this risk mitigation role because it's short of adequate capital. You know, the insurance markets are not as deep as I think people think they are, particularly when you're looking at the scale of to 26% or even 7% of GDP of, of even a small nation? Well, you know, there's no shortage of the demand for insurance in this situation. The question is, would you be a rational supplier? Uh, and how would you how would you take on that? And how would you, uh, now you'll be a rational supplier if you can hedge that risk, right? So I think one of the things we're saying is this is not a risk that's easy to hedge. Um, because there are no, they're, they're, uh, it is becoming increasingly correlated with more things, so there's less offsets, uh, and then you have to offset more and more because of, of its increasing frequency and, uh, and impact. Um, I think the other challenge will be, Michael, that it might begin appearing to be insurable, and then when we discover it's not, the insurers will not renew your insurance. So it's a little bit like a seatbelt that works until you start speeding. So you'll have it until people realize that they can't insure this risk. Hmm. Well, Avi, ever so sadly, uh, we've we've run to time. Oh, well, actually, I could squeeze one in. I think you know Hugo Innes. Uh, oh, yes. uh, have you looked at the company uh, OTT Risk, who are looking at pricing catastrophic risk bonds deemed previously uninsurable? Are you familiar with them, OTT Risk? 
I, I, I'm, you know, I've, I've seen the name, but I'm not very familiar with them. I, I, I think, you know, we, we've thought a lot about the um, whether this is really sometimes, you know, something is insurable, but the market doesn't exist. And the arrival of cap bonds, I think, showed us that we can create markets. Uh, and but we believe there's a fundamental, intrinsic reason why this is not insurable. And I'm going to squeeze this in because it's too good. Andrew, be quicker in the future. This is from Andrew Shaw uh, on the last minute. Uh, Avi, you'll have to be brief. Avi, your focus is on acute rapid onset risks. You know, uh, do you have any thoughts on the role of finance in creating resilience to chronic slow onset risks? Uh, for exa example, temperature rises that change the suitability maps for certain crops or commodities that underpin a large percent of national GDP. And he gives us an example. Andrew says, you know, cocoa in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire. Well, most definitely, and I think that the, the, the instruments are going to be similar because you need to build resilience uh, from it. You, you sort of have more time maybe to build that resilience, uh, but sometimes it takes time to build resilience, whether we're coming up with resilient strains of cocoa, et cetera. Yeah, very good. That'd be fascinating. Um, and I think, one, uh, we've all learned uh, you know, a lot really about this, these nat the importance potentially of these natural disaster clauses. I think your three points on refining them you know, very much, you know, the, what's the boundary of a natural disaster and widening of that uh, and making them uh, NPV neutral. Wow, that was fascinating. I hadn't appreciated that myself. And I think that's a fundamental change in the look of the bonds. And so it is interesting that you're trading at a, at a narrower spread rather than a wider one uh, and at good rates. And of course, the strippability, which is which is crucial if you're going to get into a traded market. So all of those were, were superb points. If you can hold for a second, I've got three quick rounds of thanks. Firstly, as ever, to our sponsors. I hope you found this as interesting as I have. What, what a fascinating session. Uh, a thanks to the audience. Uh, Andrew Shaw has apologized. We'll be quicker the next time. Uh, think faster, people. Um, I'm used to FS Club people thinking very fast. Uh, but we do, as ever, have more events. The best way to do it is to go to the website. Uh, tomorrow, dialing in from Canada is Usman on crypto asset regulation. Uh, and on we go, and I won't read it to you. But lastly, my, my most sincere thanks uh, really has to go to you, Abby, for preparing such a fascinating and challenging uh, presentation for us here. We like to think we're at the core of finance. What are we really doing about that front line? And you've given us some, some, some grips, really, that we can get, get our hands on and start moving towards it. So thank you so very much. I am unable in today's technologically challenged times to open the floodgates of Barbadian applause, but I have here my Korean karmic clapper, which we'll have to substitute. Uh, and we hope to have you <laughs> back you soon, Abby. Take care. Great. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.